Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. This is your host, Fei Wu. Clint is a really interesting guy who is a thinker, writer, and surfer. At the end of part one of our conversation, Clint revealed that he discovered surfing at the age of 50. He said that every decision I made was to clear some space, get some creatives in my life, and be free. Once I am free, I ask myself, what do I do with my freedom? So this question is exactly what part two will answer for you. In part two, we talk about the daily ritual and mindfulness meditation that Clint practices every day. He also talks about learning how not to live in a narrative and really just live his life as it was happening without constantly putting a narrative frame around it. We also talked about the lovely book called Buddhist Brain. If you haven't read it, highly recommend the fact that we're constantly biased towards negative interpretations because that was what kept us alive. We needed to be alert at all times, but that's not the situation anymore. Often than not, we overassess and over-identify, which prevents us from living the life we want. If you like this episode, please check out my other episodes on the Face World podcast. They can be easily accessed via iTunes, Stitcher, or a podcast RSS feed of your choice. You can go to my website at faceworld.com, F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D, for show notes, tools, and resources. Sometimes I include really cool videos of these people, companies as well. So the best thing you could give me is a review on iTunes if you enjoyed the show and recommend to your family and friends. I love telling stories and perhaps the next story will be your story. So feel free to connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I am everywhere. Without further ado, please welcome your very special guest today, Clint Willis. and I talked back at my dinner table and really influenced my personal life, my career in the past four years. And, you know, even though to be quite honest, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not surfing every day, doing what I love (laughs) every day, but I'm really, um, really building a life around it and I'm actively taking actions and podcasting, you know, is certainly one of them. There are difficult um, days as well, you know, like taking on a project at the size, editing, writing, yeah. um, which yeah. is something I'm always hesitant about. Um, you know, there are a lot of late nights, they're canceling plans over the weekend, but nothing has ever felt this rewarding to me. Um, and so f- thanks to you, I've always um, thought about this. And of course, in the process of talking to my mom, to my friends about, Um, you're one of the reasons why I'm doing this. And of course, it's like, why not interview Clint? (laughs) (laughs) That's so nice, Faye. Well, that's, I'm, 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 uh, I'm really glad if anything I said has been useful to you. But honestly, I really think whatever you're doing is really just a reflection of your energy, you know? It's really cool. It's really cool. But I'll never forget the book you recommended, Wherever You Go, There You Are. Oh, yeah. You know, I bought that book, the, I think, about an hour after we had that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, Faye, I mean, that, you know, in that sense, it reminds me of myself. You know, I was, I was really motivated. Like, I was super motivated to feel better. And so if somebody offered me advice that seemed, you know, or some kind of a resource that seemed like it might be of use, I was all over that. And, you know, clearly you're like that, too. I mean, some people, I think, are really motivated to, to figure this stuff out. And I can really relate to that. So, yeah, good. Good for you. You know, one of my favorite questions to ask, though not all interviewees will be able to answer that because (laughs) is, uh, don't worry, it's not a scary one. (laughs) That's cool. (laughs) 
<laughs> is that your daily ritual because <laughs> have the most interesting daily ritual oh, like waking funny. up at three and go surfing or something but you know one of my interviews said i can't answer that question because i don't have a ritual i don't <laughs> So. Wow, that's an that's a great question to ask me. It's not an easy one to answer. I mean, I used to be governed by um, by you know I'd have lists and schedules, you know, and I'd, I'd I used to try to simplify my schedule. Like, but for a long time, you know, I always tried to make sure that every day I meditated, did yoga, did some exercise, and then did some work that I you know cared about, and uh, and I would try to like. And that, or did some work, and that there were usually two kinds of the work, you know, around my company, which I, you know, really cared about, and then other kinds of work that I wanted to be doing. So I was trying to cram in a whole bunch of stuff, and if I couldn't do it, I used to feel sort of bad about it, you know, and, um, you know, so I'd get up super early, and I'd be just, my day would just be full of activities, you know, and when I was working on the anthologies, you know, of course, I was always reading, 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 and um, and then when I was writing my book, I was, that was, that just, it just filled up all this extra space, you know, after I did my, you know, I had to meditate and do yoga and exercise or I wouldn't feel good. And that was sort of necessary. But then I had all this work I needed to do to make a living. And I also had all this other stuff I needed to do around my own writing. So I was a busy guy, you know, and I, you know, and so my ritual would be like, I'd get up at, for a while I was on a swim team where I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning and swim to get my exercise done. And then I'd come home and meditate and do yoga. And then I would start my work day. I'd go into the office when we had an office. We have one again, but for a while we didn't. And I'd, I'd write in the morning, you know, I'd, I was doing lots of writing in those days. I'd write all morning. And then in the afternoon, um, I would meet with people at, and, you know, that was when people would, I'd have my office hours, basically, people would come in and talk to me about their pieces that they were working on or whatever. And then, uh, and then in the evening, I'd come home and I'd be reading for the anthologies, you know, so I was a busy guy. And I'd see the kids when I got home and sometimes I drove them to school. Um, and then on the weekend, I'd try to go climbing a couple times a month, you know, so it was kind of nuts to tell you the truth. Um, mm -hmm. These days, my ritual is way, way more like loosey-goosey like I there's some things like I really like to do like if there's good surf around you know wherever I happen to be if I'm here or if I'm like we spend some time in Costa Rica in the winters um, and so I surf when I'm down there I surf every morning you know try to surf every morning first thing and depending on the tide and here I try to surf in the mornings if there's anything at all um, but some days there's no no surfing how early uh, do you surf these days Oh, not particularly early because, you know, around here it's sort of cold and dark, especially this time of year. So I wait till the sun's up, you know. But usually you need to get out before the wind comes up and it's, it really varies with the time of the year and stuff like that. But, but generally speaking, um, by late morning, uh, sometimes the wind will have turned in a direction that's not great for the surf. Uh, so, you know, you just try to get out in the morning. Um, but sometimes, and then sometimes in the evening, you know, so if there's surf, I try to do that. I have um, a lot of my work for the company is just meetings, like regular meetings with people where we kind of go over what's that issue, what do we need to do about it. Um, so I meet with my, my se sort of most senior partner. We meet once a week and go over stuff. And then, so I try to do some work every day to sort of chip away at whatever the sort of big picture issues for the company are. And I'll typically do that in the afternoon um, and uh, you know late morning into the afternoon um, and then I, I, I have a yoga teacher who I really love here in Portland and I go to a couple of her classes a week and so some days I have yoga some days I'm surfing some days and then you know but I but I'm it's way not it's not a ritual anymore and then of course I try to I try to meditate uh, every day but I do it in like sometimes I'll sit for a while I used to sit for like, you know, an hour every day on my cushion. Now I'll, I'll meditate in bed. I'll meditate, you know, for 10 minutes. I'll meditate, you know, maybe half hour, a few times a week. But What type of meditation do you do? Um, that's, a new, that's cool. You know, I could talk about that for a while. You know, I, I started doing, you know, Vipassana meditation, mindfulness meditation, the kind of John Kabat-Zinn sort of thing. Just, you just watch your breath in and out of your body. You, you, you're, you're aware of your body, you know, and various feelings in your body, sounds, things like that, you know. Um, 
And then um, over the years, you know, I've had some exposure to different uh, traditions. You know, I've done some Zen meditation, um, although not real seriously in the sense that people mean that, but seriously in my sense, in the sense that I was seriously interested in what it had to teach me. And so my practice now is, um, and then I've also studied with a really cool yoga teacher named Eric Schiffman, S-C-H-I-F-F-M-A-N-N, who's just an amazing kind of um, you know, he's well known in certain circles, but he's he's not super, super famous like he would be if people had any sense. <laughs> but uh anyway, he's such a cool guy. And he he has he uses meditation as you know his main practice as a yoga teacher and um and so, you know, I mean how would I describe his thing? His has a lot to do with just relaxing, like getting super, super relaxed, um and then listening. You know, and in the end, it feels like all these traditions, you know, including psychotherapy, you know, because I did that for like 25 years, right? That they all sort of feel like these little like uh, tributaries and they all flow into the same river and the river is saying the same things, you know, and it's saying, I mean, what Eric says and his, his, his way of summing it up is as good as any. His, his message is relax as much as you possibly can, listen and then dare to do as your deepest feelings tell you. So you get super relaxed so that the noise dies down. And then you listen and you see what actually comes up and feels true for you, whether it's, you know, it's not necessarily a, a, a message in language. It's usually going to be a feeling. Like, and, that, and that may come, that may evolve into an idea, you know, of what to do. And then have the courage to do it, even if it may feel a little bit like, well, that's not exactly practical or you know there are a lot of fears that may arise around it but if you're super relaxed and super clear then you just go and do it and that's kind of what I feel like a lot of these traditions are telling us in these techniques and these you know and what they're learning with brain science and all the rest of it is you just got to get super relaxed and then you kind of know what to do you know but as long as you're feeling really tense and worried and freaked out you're going to make less skillful decisions, you know, that are going to lead to less happy outcomes, you know, for you and other people. It's very true. And the good news is, you know, at a company like Arnold, where I work right now, um, you know, there's yoga classes running all the time and there are free mats and there's, you know, all these props that, you know, kind of stacked up and very accessible to people. And I know a lot of other companies are practicing uh, creating meditation rooms to invite mm-hmm. employees giving them a I think it's really interesting mm-hmm. because someone like myself I mean practice taekwondo yoga multiple times a week and and I you know basically understand and sympathize that there are parents you know who commute from really far out and don't have the privilege to do that and having that at work makes me think that Maybe in, in sort of in modern age, uh, uh, work life and uh, the companies have taken a slightly different approach to understand what you described as in, in order to make better decisions, to work better, mm-hmm. we all need a life balance, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's super important. Like, we just need to get calm, you know? We've actually, Jennifer um, went to this training for yoga teachers who work with veterans who have post-traumatic stress, and I went with her, and it was really cool weekend really interesting and one of the things you know it it was a reminder that we all have you know all this stuff going on in our body you know like our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system and you know all that other stuff that I I'm not you know I don't I don't have that stuff figured out or wired you know I don't I don't have all the terminology and stuff and I don't really know that much about it but it's pretty clear basically that when we get in a difficult spot, it's usually there's something physical going on, something biological going on. And a lot of these practices are basically just about getting ahead of that, you know, and getting to a place where we're, where we're not inappropriately activated, you know, where we're not in fight or flight over something that really doesn't threaten our existence. It just, it's an echo of some memory or it's some minor thing that we're turning into a story. I mean, all this mindfulness stuff is like, it's, it's about, and it's interesting for me because, I mean, one of the reasons I'm not writing these days, really, I'm not writing, you know, books or anything like that. One of the reasons is that I, I, I came to a decision that it wasn't a great idea for me as a person to spend all my time in a narrative, that I had gotten super good at that over the years. It's something that a lot of us are good at. 
and I was too good at it that I wanted to be, I wanted to actually live my life the way it was actually happening without constantly putting a frame around it that was a narrative frame, you know. This is where it's leading, this is where it's been. I don't think that's very interesting to me anymore. It was, it was a way to structure my life in a way that gave it some kind of pseudo meaning, I guess, and maybe even some genuine meaning or whatever, but I do a lot less of that these days. And I think when I was writing, you know, trying to write books and things, I did a lot more of it because it was, it just came naturally to me. And you know, when you practice something, you, the more you do it, the better you get at it, the more you do it, right? And I needed to take a break from storytelling. And I think that's true for all of us on some level. And a lot of these practices are about that. Quit making up stories about that person who's given you a hard time. But, you know, like, and what's going to happen next? And because they put you in a place where you're basically, you know, you're like a caveman ready to like hit someone on the club with on the head with a club, you know, if they come near you because you figure they're going to kill you and take all your stuff. I mean, that's just not going to happen to us, generally speaking, you know? It, it is so true. I love that example. Yeah. Um, you know, and I feel like it's a lot of the times and less often than not, we don't see things better than they are, but many of us see things worse than they are. And oh, yeah. Oh, that's totally the way we're biased. I mean, this, you know, there's this book that's sort of, you probably heard of it, Buddha's Brain. Yeah, I've heard and, of it. Once again, Jennifer was reading it, so I like picked it up and started reading it too. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly one of the points they make early in the book is that we are biased towards negative interpretations of stuff because that's what kept us alive, you know, out on the Serengeti, you know, two million years ago when our brains were like half as big as they are now. Like we, we were, we needed to be alert to every possible threat because if you missed one, that could be it for us, you know, and that's not really the situation anymore, but we've gotten great at us at create it i was going to say it assessing threats i think we over assess threats and over identify them i mean that's what the literature seems to say and that's been my experience i've spent my whole life worrying about stuff that never happened you know it's ridiculous what a bad use of your you know of your time on the planet to be like afraid all the time of stuff that never comes true I, I well, can't wait to meet the twenty-year-old Clinton. I'll be like, "What did you do, the Clinton?" <laughs> I don't think you would have known it then either. You know, I was—I seemed like this, like kind of laid-back, kind of slightly—I don't know—not that bright twenty, you know, Southern boy. But um, I mean, my first girlfriend in college, when I saw her, like years and years later, she said, "You know, I didn't even—I I didn't think you were smart, man. <laughs> 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 I just thought you were good looking." <laughs> I was thinking, anyway. which we need a picture of you for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, right? No, I was uh, no, I was a handsome kid, but I uh, I was afraid. I think I was afraid of um, of uh, I think what I was really afraid of. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a try. Right? I think I was afraid that if I didn't get things right, that I would be abandoned and alone. You know, that I would be alone in this really difficult situation that I couldn't manage, you know, just the human condition, you know, that I would just, that I was afraid that I would get to a place where I'd be even more afraid, you know, that, that's, I was afraid of being afraid, actually, you know, just of being terrified. Um, like all the time, you know, sometimes I, it's like when you're not in somebody's um, brain, you don't quite understand how it works and how to connect the dots, but, you know, was it, what were some of the the downstream impact, like actions you took or didn't take? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, no, really good question, too. I mean, I think I didn't, um, I didn't look at the world and say, well, what do I want to do? Mm -hmm. I looked at the world and said, well, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to protect myself? You know, so I mean, everything from like, it never occurred to me, you know, the various kinds of, I don't know, careers I might have had, like the kind of work I might have done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that I could just say, well, I'll just go do that, you know, because I, I probably could have, you know, I was like, not everyone has that luxury, but I sort of did, you know, if I was willing to make certain whatever choices. And I just didn't know that I could just go out into the world and navigate, you know, my towards a direction I wanted to go and just do whatever the hell I wanted on some level. Like there, we have a lot of freedom in this country. And I don't mean not talking about what people usually talk about, although that's certainly part of it, you know. Um, we don't live in a dictatorship or something. Mm -hmm. um, we don't live in a perfect democracy, I realize that. But some of us have a lot of freedom. And um, we have, a, 
you know, even if we don't have tons of money, what we think it takes to be financially independent is way, way more than it really takes if you're willing to make certain choices. Um, and I think I was afraid to make those kind of choices. I needed some kind of security and I needed, um, I just, you know, honestly, I think I just worried. I don't, I don't think it was like, that was the worst part. I just spent a lot of time worrying, just feeling anxious and trying to deal with that. So it was a distraction from the possibilities that lay all around me to just enjoy life as it unfolds. It was more that than not doing particular things. That, that was probably something, you know, I sometimes I ask the question of what would you say to your 20-year-old self? So that sounds like that, what you just mm. said now. Yeah, yeah, I definitely would have said, you know, dude, it's okay. Don't be so scared. It's going to be okay. You know, just, just like get, I would have given him the advice Eric gives his students, you know, Try to relax, man. Here's how to do. That. Yeah, yeah. You got your looks. You you got that card. <laughs> <laughs> it it would have been like, like you know, you you know. I think I would have said, just really try to relax, man, and then listen and do, you know, and then dare to do whatever comes up, what you really, really want to do. And I think for me in my life, the things that have worked out have been when I've been willing to take certain risks, you know, and mm -hmm. it that's worked out really well. Okay, um, let me ask that question again. If you were an ugly guy, what would you say to yourself? <laughs> I'd say, who cares? It doesn't really matter at all. It's just a, it's like a, uh, <laughs> it's a social kind of historical point in time that people think this is a disagreeable, you know, set of features. But that changes all the time. It's just completely meaningless, and yeah. you know, uh, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I mean, I was, I think I sort of was vain about it when I, well, here's what happened to me. My dad told me when I was young that I wasn't good looking. So I didn't know that I was a decent looking kid until this is like funny. years and years of, why like, did he lie to you? Uh, I, I don't think he, I don't think he thought I was a good looking kid because I think the conventions of his time were different. Mm -hmm. you know? And then I, and I think, you know, those conventions continue to change. Like it, you know, like it's, it's, it just continues to evolve. So the idea of unattractive is sort of, I also think that it's, it's um, a lot of someone being good looking actually has to do with, you know, what's going on behind their eyeballs, you know, like, mm -hmm. and you, you know, I think one of the reasons I was an attractive kid was because I was sad and it was, and it showed, you know, I mean, you couldn't, and people are drawn to that, like to sadness. And then, and there was a period where I really used that, like, without really meaning to, I used it, you know, I was super sad, I was like, all right, that's my thing, I'm really sad, people seem to like it, so I would, I, would, I would just be sad, and what I found was that the only flaw with that was it meant you really had to be sad all the time, <laughs> which, which in fact you can get pretty attached to, you know, you can get really attached to that, but, but in the end it's, it, it, it forecloses so many other possibilities that are better that I decided to give it up. <laughs> no, this is actually, I know this is sensitive and I don't mean to be a... Oh, no, it's hilarious. It is hilarious because yeah. I remember when I was being forced to go to a Tony Robbins seminar uh, when I was like 18, 19. I don't regret it, but uh, uh -huh. one of the things he said I thought was very true is, you know, he went to um, talk with this woman like live and she was very depressed. She talked about how depressed she was and she had all the reasons and you know, yeah. she was, it just very sad life. And then he shook her and surprised all of us. And you know, he said it takes a lot of energy, your posture, your expression mm -hmm. to be sad. And it's a lot of work. And she said, you're right. It's a lot of work yeah. to maintain this. Yeah. Um, and you it is a lot of work. It. Yeah, it is a lot of work. It was just, it, I knew how to do it. I was good at it. You know, that's the other thing. You, you get good at, at certain ways of managing your life, but in the end, you're sort of stuck in those ways, you know, and yeah. giving up your strategies and letting go of your strategies is a huge part of, I think, growing up and, and getting happy. And, and you need help to do that. Like I, like I said, I, I had 25 years of therapy like talk therapy with an amazing therapist. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I really was hanging on, you know, and, um, uh, and hell, it was her idea to stop too, right? So I was, I was perfectly willing to keep doing that forever. It's hard to let go. You know, we, we get our patterns set and, and then we're stuck in them and, we, and they make us unhappy ultimately and, and we got to figure out ways to get safe enough that we can let go of those patterns. 
you know? So, I mean, the first thing I think is to find, find ways to feel safe, to feel as safe as we actually are, because we are safe. I mean, mm -hmm. once we realize that we're connected to everything else and that the picture is much bigger than we think it is and that, you know, I mean, the whole thing of Buddhism is there is no, no permanent, unchanging self that persists forever, you know, or even more than a moment. And once you start to actually feel that a little bit, it is pretty liberating because you're, you, you don't have anything to protect anymore, you know, or at least you have this clue that maybe there's not so much to protect And just even that clue, I think, really can help. Mm -hmm. Just knowing it as a con even as a conceptual possibility, it's comforting. And I uh, feel like the more you need to protect, the less you could hold on to, you know. And yeah. um, it just really, it's really fascinating. And I remember when we met for the first time four years ago, we sat down and we started talking about, um, you know, uh, sort of um, seeing. I, it, this is interesting. I. I actually, I lost my father just about two, three months ago, and I made um, a choice that my, my mom didn't even know at the time was to actually go see a shrink, and partially it's because the company I was working at the time offered these like five to six shrink sessions, and I knew they were expensive, so I was hoping that they would, um, I would benefit from it, and, uh, but you know, from from my culture where I grew up and I remember especially when my dad was suffering um, towards the end of his life I was encouraging him to even consider that and he was really turned off by it and mm. and then I encouraged my mom who was his caretaker and she immediately refused the option as well and yeah. there I was you know um, I couldn't I couldn't tell you how much I benefit uh, from that and we start talking about it um, the dinner table and I felt very supported and in, in, you know you were a gift to me to mm. uh, reassure me that I, I made the right decision mm. and you know I'm not seeing anyone right now but seeing any shrinker right now but I feel like to your point if I do need that and I know not just an outlet I have I have a strategy I have a path and yeah yeah it's very powerful yeah. Oh, very. I mean, it's so important to uh, it's so important to connect to people and who who have some wisdom and some clarity. It's so important, and so much of what we encounter in our day to day life is not um, is not supportive. You know, uh, and 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 if we're in a certain place, a lot of what we encounter in life is supportive, but we aren't in a position to appreciate or notice it even. Mm. So I don't know. It's hard. It's hard being human. It really is hard. Yeah. yeah it's hard. And I, you know, I mean, you've been very sweet talking about, you know, you know, how what I said benefited you and how I seem to have certain things figured out. But believe me, you know, I'm still working. I'm still working. It's, there's a lot that I, I'm clear about intermittently, but I don't always feel that clear, you know, and I think that's okay. You know, it's the way it is apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I've taken up a lot of your time and I begin to think that this will be a perfect two part interview. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I really think two parts that this two part thing is magical because people, not necessarily, I don't mean you, but there are people who are not as comfortable um, talking about things. When you create a two part, the second part is almost guaranteed to be better than part one. Uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah right. for a variety of reasons. And my, my last question, I promise you, I'll let you into <laughs> speaking of. No worries. Yeah, I'm just so intrigued. I met your uh, both of your sons a few years ago, and but very, very briefly, they were already possibly you know 18, 20, 21. And mm -hmm. I wondered, and that's after we had this uh, very heartfelt conversations, and it intrigued me to think what it's like to uh, be your kids or vice versa, like to what is it? What what type of parent you are? I I would imagine you have two boys. I would mm. imagine they have to be, uh, even if they're not the best behaved kids, but I'm sure they are. They're <laughs> you know very welcoming. They're very kind. But I mm. feel like you must have been like a friend, a buddy. You know, mm. what were you like, and what did you get into conflicts? How do you resolve that? As yeah, a friend? that's interesting. You know, um, it's really hard to look back on your past self and know what was really going on, I think, is what I experienced when I think about myself as a father to them when they were younger. I know that, you know, as I said to you earlier, I was, when I was younger, when they were small, I was, I was still pretty anxious, pretty worried about stuff. So there was some fear, you know, that I carried. And I, 
and some of it had to do with them. Would they be okay? Would things go all right for them? You know, that sort of thing. And I, I wasn't a conventionally fearful parent, like worried about, oh, are you going to do well in school and get, you know, the right, into the right college on one level. But I think deeper down I was, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of, um, a little bit of self-deception around that stuff. You know, I was kind of pretending to be cooler about stuff than I was. I was worried, you know, and so that kind of fear, you know, in a parent, I think is kind of a drag, you know, it's not ideal, um, probably. But uh, at the same time, I always, always just loved having them as kids, you know, and that was really nice. You know, it was just so fun to have them as kids and to be around them. And like, you know, at different times, like there would be conflict um, for sure, you know, and, uh, you know, it's always a bumpy ride growing up and having kids and families. It's, it's somewhat bumpy. But essentially, I think we were a really happy family family unit the four of us we had a great time and um i miss them a lot you know but at the same time i'm super god i'm just like super happy about who they are becoming you know they're these amazing grown-ups now and as you say they are both very kind people like they have really good good hearts (laughs) and that's true i noticed that yeah and they're doing work that they love you know they're both um Harper is a sound engineer and a producer and he does, he's also like a guitarist. So he does some performing and Abner is really into film. He makes videos for like retail and fashion and music type clients. And he's also a musician. So he still does some of that. And They have really wonderful girlfriends and they're having a great time, you know, and just being cool people and finding their way and uh, still love being with them and really miss them, you know, but um we had a good time when they were growing up, you know, all of us. And Jennifer loved, loved, loved being a mom. You know, she just loved having the two boys to raise. And, yeah. Uh, because I'm not yet a parent and um, mm. I realize that um, when I interview people and, you know, parenthood is such an interesting topic. And, it, you know, for me, I feel like um, I've been thinking about how when I'm a parent one day, what would I like to be and what have I learned from my own upbringing, my experience, what I loved about my parents. And I feel like where the disconnects, why the disconnects um, um, were as well. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's interesting and it's a, it's a tough job to have, <laughs> very tough one. So it's a tough yeah. question. It's a tough job. It's a really cool job, actually, I think. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I never thought of it as a tough job. I just really thought at times there was stuff that was hard. But a lot of it was self-imposed, you know. And again, it comes back to fear. Like, to me, like, fear was always uh, got between me and, and, and really fully, well, having a better time, let's put it that way. You know, when you're afraid, it's hard to have fun. And so I was always managing my fear on some level, and I was very aware of it. And, you know, that was one helpful thing. Over the years, I became more aware. I mean, sometimes I think you live in fear, and you don't even know it. Mm, you just, that's the worst. You just think that's the way it is, right? So you're just afraid all the time. I think that's terrible. Um, but I learned so much from the, you know, the difficulties that I had were so, they taught me a lot. And one of the things they taught me is what I was saying before, and I'm super aware of that as I talk to you tonight, like so much gratitude for people who actually have you know figured some stuff out and then are able to be present for people who are still working on it you know I have an immense admiration for people like therapists and teachers and social workers and doctors and just people who are out there just helping other people deal with the stuff that people have to deal with you know there's a lot of them like and I'm you know it kind of makes me uh it's very I guess I, I can never think of a better word, like humbling mm. when you encounter those people and the work that they do. I mean, I thought it was a big deal to be a certain kind of writer, you know, and I spent a lot of my career trying to get to a place where I could do certain kinds of writing. And, and in the end, it reali- I realized that, you know, that's a fine thing to do and it can be really cool and you can make a contribution, but it's, it's certainly no, no more impressive. And, and in, in fact, one could make the case that it's it's, it's not impressive at all compared to the work that people do every day um, just to help other people directly with the kind of hard stuff people have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is very meaningful, and I think this is 
I couldn't find a better ending um, to the podcast is to feel to be grateful um, mm. you know people talk about the moment you start thinking only in terms of expectation um, mm. that's when the disappointments and the satisfaction <laughs> will come from that's so true yeah that's so true interesting yeah. well Faye thank you so much I really enjoyed you know talking about all this stuff and you, you're so generous in the way you talk about me <laughs> To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.